Our third important concept here um, is talking about p-values. So I've mentioned this a few times today already, and God knows how many times throughout the, the unit so far, is not just to rely on p-values. So while we use p-values to interpret the statistical significance of our results, of our data, we really need to be aware of the limitations that affect those individual numbers that we get and how easily they can be skewed or affected or kind of biased. And the week lecture talked about that, talked about in the context of sample sizes. So if you have a small sample size study, you have low statistical power, which means that your p-value is going to be a bigger number and therefore less likely to be significant. Whereas if you have a big sample size study, you're going to have high statistical power and therefore your p-value will be smaller and it will be more likely to be significant. So something as simple as the sample size of the study can directly, directly change the actual value of that p-value that you get. And that's one of the many reasons why it's important that you think about effect sizes, you think about how big the effect is, how substantial it is, how meaningful it is to you, and you use that to interpret your results to, to kind of get that take-home message about what it is that you found in conjunction with the p-values. And there are people such as myself that think that effect sizes are probably more important than the actual p-values themselves, the actual statistical significance itself. It's very easy to have a very overly simplistic view of significant or not significant, p bigger than 0.05, p smaller than 0.05, but the reality of the world and the reality of statistical analysis is much, much, much more complicated than that and much more nuanced than that. So you really need to have a kind of a less black and white approach to interpreting your results and one of the ways of doing that is by thinking about the effect size, how big the effect is, rather than just is it significant or not. Point number four uh, is something that we talked about a little bit kind of briefly towards the start of term and Mike talked about a little bit in the week 12 lecture is this idea of the importance of replication um, and how important replication is for us to really understand what actually is happening in the world, what is happening in a population, how human beings actually do function, what the, the truth of human behavior actually is. And it's really fundamental to science, not just in the field of psychology. So if you conduct an individual study well, if you follow the scientific me method rigorously, if you have good research design, if you kind of have gold standards of all of the kinds of principles of running these sorts of things, then you should have a lot of faith in the findings that you get, in the conclusions that you can draw based on the actual results that you get. But any perfectly designed study can never overcome sampling variability. In that there's always the possibility that an individual study might be very, very different to what's really going on at a population level, at the general population, through no fault of your own. Even if you followed all of the good principles of research design, of conducting your study, it might just be that the sample of people you get are just weird and they give you very different results than, the, the, than any other sample would be. So any one study is never going to be perfectly representative of a population. So you can do as much as you can to try and make them representative, but you're never actually going to know if they actually are representative which is why it's really important in terms of understanding um, findings, understanding things about human behavior, that we conduct studies multiple times with multiple samples under multiple conditions and to try and get a sense of what the average effect is, what the kind of average take home effect is. Um, and that the more that we do that, the more confidence we can be to see what the real effect might be in the population. So whether it actually does exist widely in the population and what the size of it is in the population. And this is a really, really nice demonstration of that principle. So I know you can't read that probably based on the slides, but I've given you the link there. So go and have a read of this uh, comic and it's a really, really nice demonstration of the principle here of why replication is so important. And that leads really nicely into our fifth point here, which is the benefits of meta-analyses. So because any one individual study, even if you do your best, might just genuinely not be representative of the population, 
in terms of learning what we can learn about you know human functioning about human beings about human behavior studies that are reviews of individual empirical studies that are reviews of primary studies like systematic reviews and meta-analyses are really the best way of trying to get a sense of what the general message is what the general conclusion is or what the general findings are from any individual field of work so once you have multiple studies that conduct the same kind of thing, so replication studies, using a tool like a meta-analysis can help us to understand what the average effect is, what the general effect is aggregated or averaged across all of those individual studies. So even if individual studies give you slightly different results, which they're going to, because that's just the way sampling variability works, a meta-analysis is really useful in getting a sense of what the general picture is. So they can tell you what the overall average effect is, also called the pooled effect. So what the average effect is, how big it is. It can also determine why there's variation between studies. So look at factors that predict or that explain differences in findings between studies. So whether studies on adolescents produce generally different kinds of findings to studies on, on adults whether studies that were conducted in the US produce different findings to studies that were conducted in Australia, you know, what the reason is behind this variation. They can also give you an insight into the quality of the individual studies. So because each individual study will vary from, you know, how well it's conducted, how rigorous the methods are that were used, how, whether it's a high quality study or a low quality study, um, Meta-analyses can be really useful to see whether high quality studies give us different answers to low quality studies. And tools like meta-analyses are also particularly useful if you're looking at a field or a research question where you've got a number of like low powered, meaning low sample size usually, or small effect size studies. So say, for example, you were looking for uh, the benefit of treatment on a very, very rare disease. And because the disease is so rare, it's very hard to find people to participate in your research study to test out new possible treatments for this disease. So through no fault of your own, you might just end up with a bunch of studies that have very small sample sizes because there's just genuinely not that many people that can participate in the research. So if individual studies are not powered to find significant results, if the sample sizes are too small to get statistically significant results, then using something like a meta-analysis is a really good approach in order to see what the individual um, studies put together, what kind of messages it is that they're telling us. And they can even help for if you have large sample size studies because any individual study still might not be representative of a general population. So you heard a little bit about this and got an idea of the kinds of things that meta-analyses can do back in your week 12 lecture. But I just wanted to give you another example here. Um, and this example is taken from a paper that was published a few years ago, looking for how successful, how efficacious self-care practices are for students who are postgrad students studying psychology, professional psychology. So budding practicing psychologists how important it is, how beneficial it is for the students themselves to engage in self-care practices. So looking after themselves when they're learning about psychology, practicing psychology. And this graph on the right hand side here is a graph that's usually used when meta-analyses are communicated. And what this is representing is the individual effect sizes from each individual study and the amount of variability around that effect size for each individual study. So the study up the top here, this box in the middle is the average effect size from that study. And then the width of the bars is representing how much variability between people there is in whether self-care was useful or not. So the black um, vertical line here is what's representing no difference between people who do versus don't engage in self-care. So an effect size is zero. And anything above the black line on the right hand side here is evidence in favor of the benefit of self-care. And the further away from the effect size of zero, any individual study's effect size is, the more benefit there was to self-care. So like this study here, this Sprague 2013, no 2012 study, showed the biggest effect, the biggest benefit to self-care practices. 
Whereas this study here, this McKinsey et al. 2006 study, showed no benefit to self-care. So it, was a, it showed an effect size of zero. And what you can see across all of these studies is that there's variability in how beneficial self-care was. So there were some studies that found it was really, really, really beneficial. Other studies that found it was only very slightly beneficial. And another study, this one here, that found it wasn't beneficial at all. And as I mentioned before, there's always going to be differences between studies and there's going to be reasons for those differences. But the benefit of a meta, oh, the benefit of a meta analysis, I've lost my animation here. The benefit of a meta analysis is that you can see what the actual average effect is. So the weighted average effect is this thing down the bottom. And imagine that there's a nice yellow box highlighting this to pick this out to you. The weighted average effect is essentially a fancy average across all of these individual studies to show what the overall benefit of self-care practices is. So overall averaged across all of these individual studies is self-care beneficial compared to not engaging in self-care. And the fact that this is quite a bit above the black line is showing that yes, it is with a moderate to large effect size. So this meta-analysis is aggregating, summarizing across all of these individual primary studies in order to show what the take home message is across different groups of people, across different labs, across different universities, across different countries of the world. On average, does self-care tend to be beneficial? for psychology students who are budding practicing psychologists? And the answer here is yes, it is. It's a relatively large effect size.